Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Zach of Wingard Wearables. Zach has pioneered the concept of the EDC tomahawk. I'm not talking folding novelty tomahawks or hand axe approximations at tomahawks, but true wearable, concealable, battle-ready tomahawks. His fascination with weaponry and the history of the Northeastern Native American tribes and his appreciation for the tomahawk as a weapon and EDC tool led to the wearable backripper, empress, and stingray tomahawks, which I have arrayed in front of me, uh, as well as other picks and implements for utility and defense. He's created a fascinating niche for himself in the knife world and has achieved something very modern using old world materials and techniques. And we're going to see what he's got cooking next. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download this to your favorite podcast app so you can listen while you're on the go. And as always, if you're interested in helping support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Now, the quickest way to do that is to head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon or simply zap the QR code. Uh, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Visit the Knife Junkie at the knifejunkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos, and more. Zach, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. It's great to have you back. Oh, thank you for having me back. It's always going to be wonderful. Um, so it up front, I was talking about how uh, you do something very modern with old world materials and concepts. And what I'm talking about is uh, the modern part being the EDC part, being the wearable part uh, that you make these full size uh, tools and weapons uh, to be wearable. Tell me about how that came about and uh, and how the back ripper was first born. Yeah. So uh, back in 2007, uh, I first attempted to carry a tomahawk. And this was uh, a Vietnam style tomahawk. It was made at the time by a company that's out of business, American Tomahawk Company. Um, and it had the head was about that long. It was like almost nine inches from the front blade to the end of the spike. The carry system was like the size of like an airplane pillow you put behind your head. It was huge, bulky. Um, so I just, I knew like fundamentally you know, a tomahawk, maximum reach, maximum lethality. That's the only edged weapon you're going to get where, you know, one strike impact to the head is not incapacitate somebody or hit them in the forearm, that sort of thing. It's, it's different than a knife. Um, you know, it's got a lot more power behind it. So I tried carrying uh, that tomahawk in 2007. And, uh, you know, I even got this underarm carry system made. And it was really uncomfortable. Like, uh, I was fatter back then. And uh, I had to wear a wife beater to protect the skin from my, uh, the mm. shoulder harness. It was like nylon webbing and stuff. And uh, you'd grab the tomahawk and pull it downward. And it made this, the kydex made this loud noise. You know? <laughs> but it was, it was awesome. It felt awesome doing it psychologically, even though this, this tomahawk was really big and, and kind of, it, it was sluggish. It weighed about a pound. Um, and then one day, you know, as awesome as it felt drawing it, one day it didn't feel awesome. It felt funny. You know, I drew it out and I was like, huh. And I looked down and the beard of the tomahawk had raked through uh, my love handle. Mm. Um, and I noticed this like expanding red spot on my uh, wife beater I was wearing to protect my skin. And I was like, huh, this EDC tomahawk thing, uh, what's out there really isn't ready for it. And so uh, years later, 2016, uh, I moved up to an area where it's very difficult to carry uh, handguns legally, like uh, states. I lived uh, at a border where, you know, states didn't have reciprocity with each other. Um, mm. And, you know, you look on the laws on the books, lots of laws prohibiting uh, knives and uh, handguns. Not really many laws uh, at the time, only Texas uh, prohibited tomahawk carry, and they've since uh, lifted that ban. Um, so, you know, I wanted to figure it out again. And uh, I started modifying cold steel tomahawks and that sort of thing, getting them lighter and, and more capable to match the historic weights. Um, you know, I reached out to uh, Jack Vargo, who wrote the book on spike tomahawks, and he mentored me and showed me um, how light and compact these things were and how they were actually made as opposed to, you know, how modern manufacturers make them. 
And so from those lessons, you know, eventually we honed in on uh, the back ripper tomahawk. Um, and, you know, I would have the, the handle roughed out of hickory. I had the heads 3D printed out plastic and dialed in the form factors. I discovered you had to have an angle on this because when you bend deeply at the waist, if you're like most American men with a beer gut, um, your beer gut will interfere if this was a straight 90 degree. Um, so little things like that. Also, you know, having the, the curve of the spike conform to one side of the body so you could sit in a butt cupping car seat comfortably. Little subtle things like that were discovered just in 3D printing a piece of plastic and tweaking it. Um, and then eventually we got these uh, blacksmith hand forged out of um, tool steel and attached to a, a Pennsylvania hickory handle with hickory wedges. And, you know, we've been, when we launched in 2018, that was our primary product. Um, and because this is, uh, you know, we do such a long, thorough design process, we only come out with maybe one to two new designs, uh, new products a year. Uh, so 2018 was the Back Ripper. Um, 2019 was the Empress, uh, which also featured that, uh, you know, offset spike to curve uh, to your waistline. And then um, this was the most complicated Tomahawk to get launched. The Stingray came out in late 2020. And you'll notice that spike is clearly straight, but it actually carries under your arm uh, quite easily. Our carry systems are uh, adaptable for clipping onto, uh, you know, think a flat stock paracord loop between the shoulders, that sort of thing. Um, so those are the three Tomahawks we came out with. Uh, and it just takes, you know, years uh, to iterate on these designs and test them. Um, so that's how it got started. You you were talking about this downward angle of the back ripper head. And I always assumed, and we've talked about this, this is our third time uh, talking mm -hmm. about this uh, formally. And uh, I, I didn't realize that this was for the beer gut uh, <laughs> leaning down because... Yeah. Uh, that angle actually is very efficient on a chop. It follows the arc of your arm. So it really digs in sort of like the ax version of a recurve uh, on a knife. Yeah, and it also, um, if you choke up like, like this in the hand, you can use it as a box cutter type thing. You can even put a second hand on this. Like if you're cutting through, like think a uh, half inch thick um, compressed fiber board, like those take forever with a box cutter. Right. You can like get both hands on and kind of pre-score on that projecting uh, corner. Now, one of the other things we we discovered, and I won't claim I was clever enough to design it for this. I mean, it was canted to accommodate uh, the American beer gut. But when this buries into uh, you know fabric and flesh, um, one of the things that's a common problem with axe style tomahawks, especially if they're very bearded, is they get hung up. So when you do a chop and then you try to cycle back, if you were to, you know, do it like a choo-choo train, you know, doing sort of a circle type motion, you chop in, you bury, and you go like this, it's going to get hung up. But if you chop in, you use that as a ramp, you just do that, like when you extract the back ripper. Right. So when it's buried in, you use that downward cant as sort of a, to ramp out, and it really just pops clean out, no extraction problems. Um, but, you know, it does, it's all about technique. You know, you got to master the techniques. Um, sure. But, but yeah. Well, and part of that, river. part of that technique is actually carrying it and getting used to carrying it. Um, I find the Empress for me easier to carry. Uh, this is the, uh, this is my bedside tomahawk, by the way. I have, I have a, a number of bedside implements and uh, for the tomahawk angle, this is, uh, oh, yeah. this is what this, uh, because also uh, I figure if someone's, you know, on top of me, choking me in my sleep, I can grab this and use this uh, oh, yeah. very well without having to Rapping. swing it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot uh, but, of nasty ways to do that. But but what what I really want to do is congratulate you on your latest project here. You you you've been working on something uh, that you've been talking about for a while, and now it has finally hit the ground, and I'm really excited. As a matter of fact, uh, right before we started rolling, uh, I got an automated email saying mine had shipped, and I'm very excited about this. And uh, so tell us what your latest uh, product and release is. Well, you know, Tomahawks are what we launched our business with. But before the Tomahawk, there was uh, traditional war clubs. And so um, 
earlier this year, one of our customers, uh, Ernest Gindren, he's a Native American artist who makes traditional war clubs. Like this is a war club he has made. Um, and he makes ball headed war clubs too. And he owned a back ripper. And he said, Zach, I think you ought to uh, come out with an everyday carry war club. And by the way, here's a prototype I made. Uh, we get like good idea fairy type stuff all the time from people <laughs> and they're usually terrible ideas and I'm polite and I'm like, Oh, thank you. We'll think about it. You know, but uh, I've been wanting to EDC a war club uh, for a long time. I even did one of our earliest YouTube videos was about war clubs where I said as awesome as they are, they aren't practical for carry. And I was so glad that Ernest proved me wrong uh, because these just feel it. I don't know whether it's like the weight, balance or something but you just you, it, maybe it's in our dna or something but mm -hmm. you feel powerful holding it. it it feels like really good and there's just it's hard to describe until you hold it in your hand uh, holding like a traditional uh ball-headed war club and um ernest uh sent us a prototype uh where he had uh basically flattened it and it when you look at a lot of the historic ball-headed war clubs they aren't spherical uh, they're spheroid. They're kind of they aren't pure circles. So if you can see here, this is kind of got some flats on the side, um, and you know the thickness here is shorter than the thickness here. They're kind of round, you know, but they aren't perfectly circular because these are all handmade from natural materials. And so um, you know he basically gave sent a prototype to us as flat, and then we said, yeah, like this works. So let's figure out how to you know, go from your prototype to a prototype that we can manufacture like on a batch scale. And that's what led to this. This is the Thumper Wear Club. See, we had naming contests. We weren't sure what to call it. But Wear Club, get a War Club, but with an yes. extra E because you yeah. can wear it. Um, that, that was really clever who came up with that one. But um, yeah, basically... Uh, these are made from uh, Pennsylvania hickory. They're nested in a board like this and CNC to near net shape. But then when you have like, you know, CNC wood, there's like rough machining marks. Some parts are like way too rough. Some parts are way too smooth, you know, and a war club should have, you know, a textured grip. Um, and so I, uh, you know, hand scrape and rasp these. So you got that texture. Um, and then I soak them in bowl linseed oil take them out, torch them slowly because you don't want to heat up the wood too quickly, but it's charred. That's kind of called like a Sosugi bond type finish, like a Japanese style of wood finishing, waterproofing wood. Um, and then we set this steel 4140 3 uh, pin. It's a dowel pin. It's a steel rod deeply into the ball section. And that steel rod is also ground so that it comes to, let me find that a sharp right angle because like Ooh. when you actually get um you know round stock uh like pins and stuff they usually have like little fillets and chamfers on the corners because you know their their purpose is like load bearing not on the not impact all um, right but for this you know ernest knows way more about war clubs than i ever did and you know he showed me on his prototype that the point of the studs or projecting spikes that you see on some of these war clubs is to just bite into a target and fully transmit impact momentum. So even though this is a blunt impact weapon, it does have an edge around, it's a 90 degree edge, but it's still an edge yeah. uh, around the impact stud. And then, uh, yeah, it's just been great collaborating with them on it. Um, you know, it's, these are weighing around on average about 11 and a half ounces. Uh, so that's lighter than the back ripper, right? Uh, no, I mean, that's uh, lighter than the Empress, but heavier than um, the back ripper. It's heavier than the Empress and the back ripper. It's uh, okay. about a half ounce lighter than the Stingray. But some of them, you know, it's wood varies. Like some of these weigh, you know, over 13 ounces. Some of them weigh just under 10. Traditionally, like uh, one of these guys, this is like, um, you know, a 20 inch long war club that weighs about 20 ounces. Right. Um, and I mean, they were using these uh, to like, you know, against people using war clubs or muskets, you know, as, uh, you know, blocking blows and stuff. Uh, there was even, you know, before uh, the age of gunpowder reached, there, there were people wearing wooden armor 
in the huh. eastern woodlands. So you actually needed a lot of momentum to crash through. And they would often have a big like antler tying or something like that to power through. Um, but a lot of the workups actually were um, like this. They were thin, like really thin. And this would be called like a gun stock or saber style war club. Um, and this particular one is made by uh, Woodland War Clubs um, on Facebook. And it weighs about 11 ounces. And some of them got even lighter than that. Um, so the problem with this design is it's not, it actually is not EDC level. I don't think there's a way to do it because it just gets, it flares out so much. Um, right. But, you know, I really didn't envision this being EDC level either until uh, Ernest came up with like sort of a flattened ball headed war club. And it is three dimensional. Like it isn't just a board, like it's thicker here and then it tapers down. Um, so you have more mass shifted forward. Um, and with the addition of the uh, steel rod, you add 1.5 ounces to the impact zone. So it, it's actually multiple purposes. It, it both bites into the target to transmit momentum and it adds momentum. Um, and that stud goes so far back into it that um, your load is taken up and transmitted further back to the handle. One of the things we discovered in Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. I, I, I want to hear what you discovered. Not, so I mean, one of the things we did is, you know, when he, he came up to us with a concept that had a steel rod in it, I, I roughed out uh, a version of a hickory that didn't have a steel rod. And, you know, I was hitting various things with it. And when the wood directly takes up the impact, um, I noticed it would frequently skip off targets, like because it's round, right? Um, and it would sometimes, because of the direct impact, there would be like checking, like you would get in the, the ball section, little bits of uh, sort of crack propagation. It was never enough to break it, but it was like, hmm, that's kind of unsightly. Um, and so when we added the steel pin, which is what Ernest wanted originally, you know, and we lengthened it, that took the brunt of the impact and transmitted the load further back. And so that just, it, it's like one simple piece, you know, a steel rod, it, it's doing all these things in the design. It's, it's pretty amazing. So he did a really good job, you know, coming up with that concept. Um, yeah. I always, I always presumed that the spike on the ball or, or the, or whatever that was uh, coming out of the ball, I was always thinking of it for its power to puncture and and wound in that way, but but really what it is, it's like the uh, knurling on the face of a warhammer uh, from the medieval times. So it wouldn't skip off the helmet; it would dig into the helmet and transfer all that power. Exactly, and so that's why I kind of was dismissive because I thought I was thinking the exact same way. Like I would see uh, war clubs that would have like hand forged spikes coming out a couple inches or antler tines. So I was like. You know, a spike wound isn't that great, right? It's, it's a tiny little puncture wound. And what I really didn't understand at the time is there are so many examples of historic war clubs that had this little nubbin of iron coming out. And I was like, well, what's the point of that? That's barely penetrating like a half inch. Well, it's because when you hit someone in the head, it's just biting in and their brain is getting shaken up and they drop. Um, now, a lot of them didn't have uh, spikes on them, like this design. And these do uh, skip off more, uh, mm. but they're heavier too. And so, you know, even if you don't get full momentum transfer, it's, it's pretty bad news. And a lot of the designs did have this on them too, where mm. you have, uh, you know, if you do skip off or miss, you can then swing around, catch it, and then drive that chisel tip point into the opponent's torso. And so Ernest had that feature in this as well, which we included. Um, so, you know, you can two handed strike that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going to see how these, uh, go so, Watch first batch and, and they're moving. How do you find it carries? It carries well. Um, now it is bulkier because you got this, uh, you know, big, uh, disc here. This is about two and five eighths. It's a lot more mass above your belt line than our tomahawks. So you do need a covering garment on. So think like a uh, you know, jacket or an overshirt, um, but it is not as bulky as say a handgun. Like a handgun grip is, is huge compared to this uh, in volume and how far it projects. And when this is slid in the pants, you can manipulate it. You, know, you can have this facing forward or backward. 
Mm -hmm. um, but it's quite comfortable. But it is 18 inches long. So, you know, if you are, say you're under five foot eight in height, um, then the tip of it is going to be running closer to your knee joint when it's mm -hmm. worn along your body. Um, so we do, you know, if these uh, wear club concepts, you know, if the thumper sells well, we do intend to investigate other designs that are different, different materials and also different sizes. So we definitely want to come out with like a 15 inch or that sort of thing. Um, you know, just to explore the design space because I mean, you see what we've done with tomahawks yeah. uh, in diversity of design and war clubs are the same way, but it's kind of a crazy idea, right? Uh, I didn't think it was possible uh, to make it technically until uh, the prototype was in hand. And now, you know, it's sort of the question of like, okay, how much of a market appetite is there for a wearable war club? I think there must be because uh, batons, telescoping batons mm -hmm. and saps are a thing. Um, and this has a lot more capability, right? It's got a lot more momentum. You have some hooking capability too. Mm -hmm. Um, and you've got the uh, pommel two handed blocks. Those are very difficult to do with a baton, especially those aluminum telescoping batons. Right. And those just aren't possible at all with a sap. So something you were just, uh, uh, sort of hinting at uh, was come was different sizes, well, different designs, different materials. I want to talk about that in a second. Uh, but but you were basically alluding to the fact that the Empress and uh, the Back Ripper come in this size, which is 16 inches, I think, and then mm -hmm. they come in the shorter um, Molly compatible size, so that you can yeah, about slip 13 this, inches, yeah, yeah, slip that in a Molly rig. Um, that Molly rig one has uh, similar to uh, the Thumper, kind of a chisel pommel that you can mm -hmm. use. That that's yep. helpful for slipping it under the loops of a Molly system, no doubt. Yep. But also could be nice. Yeah. Uh, oh, that would hurt big, big yeah. time. But nice. I, it, yeah, if you hit the forehead, it's gonna be bad. But I mean, this is actually penetrative, like. Uh, you know, if you take a hard piece of hickory chisel edge and slam that into, you know, skin and meat, I mean, it's a hole the size of your thumb. Um, so it's a, it is a, quite a bit more potent due to the size, you know, to really get that leverage in there. Um, but we are going to make more compact ones. Hopefully, you know, if these, uh, if this becomes a successful, feasible product, you know, we hope to, to come out with more because uh, this just is wild what you could do. I mean, this is just a steel rod. Imagine if it was, tungsten heavy alloy rod imagine if it wasn't a rod at all you know if you had metal elsewhere along the design you know for uh, even more momentum yeah um, so yeah I, I just think that it's such a diverse wide open design space but you got to start somewhere and usually if you come up with a new product no one's done before you know keep it simpler you know and so this being you know just all hit one piece of hickory and then, uh, you know, a secure, deeply inserted steel rod. That's about as simple of a uh, wear club concept as one could have. And we're going to see how it goes. You know, just looking at you uh, holding that up, I showed my mother this, uh, the Empress. Uh, this was before I got the other ones. And she thought it was so beautiful. She thought it was, a, you know, just a beautiful thing to look at, a work of art. Um, and she thought it looked like a goat. And I was like, yeah, it's pretty nasty goat. Uh, but you holding that up, it's also a very, it's just a very beautiful sculptural kind of piece. Of course, it's got a function. Um, you, you know, just in following you on Instagram and watching you go through the process of your research and development, uh, especially heavy on the stingray, because there are a lot of issues in making something throwable um, like that. But, but when it comes to the uh, thumper, you've done a lot of finish work like you do on all of the handles and hafts and such how much is working on the on these pieces yourself because you you like a conductor or a producer or uh you know have have people forge your your heads over here and cast them over here and you bring it together and you and you do the hafts and stuff how much is working with the materials how important is that for you absolutely critical like uh even with our tomahawks like uh it doesn't matter if the head is cast or hand forged um it doesn't matter if the handle is cnc denier net shape like i have to do uh all the fine flush fitting finishing texturing and assembly because that's quality control right if i'm going to bring a new design out to the world 
or collaborate in this case with with someone else who brought a design to us um you know we do out uh, collaborate with others like uh you know we guess you could call it outsourcing with small american businesses to you know address things that we can't do in our own little workshop to streamline and make these more efficient um but you know it's absolutely critical going hands-on and i mean i i spend you know my weekends my my hours after uh, my day job you know just laboring on them um and it it is a lot of work but it is so satisfying you know when you finish them my wife was scolding me because as we were packing them each war club i picked up and i was just like <laughs> I, just, yes. I was holding that swing and she's like just put it in the box you know? it's just like it'll be interesting to see what your mom says about this because i have yet to meet a woman who's like oh war clubs like they have very low wife appreciation <laughs> um i don't know what it is like women think ball-headed war clubs are ugly i think they're beautiful i, I think it's just it, it's in our dna i think most men um have something in our ancestral dna where you know, our ancestors had to use something like yeah. that. And every culture everywhere had wooden war clubs somewhere in their lineage. There are all kinds of diverse designs all over the world. But if you are alive today, there are probably multiple streams of DNA yeah. contributing to you. Doesn't matter if you're, you know, ancestors are from Australia, Polynesian islands, any country in Asia, Europe, there's all kinds of archaeological evidence that wooden war clubs, I mean, were back in caveman days all the way through uh, the late 1800s. They were used somewhere in the world. Oh. Uh, if, if you're alive, depending on them. If you're alive today, it's thanks to a war club. No it, doubt. Is, it is. It is. There, there's to, no doubt because that yeah. that added to the successful breeding. You know, if you're. Oh yeah. So uh, my my uh, my parents uh, went to South Africa when I was in high school or middle school, and they brought back a Zulu war club. And now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know where it ended up. Hopefully my brother has it or hopefully my parents have it because it was so cool. And it was in our TV room for years. And it was a big, heavy uh, ball, uh, all one uh, integrated piece on a shaft. And it was heavy. And it was like, yeah. you know. If I was home alone and I, I heard something, I'd grab that war club. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, absolutely. Tucks, tuck it, you know, by the bedside or whatever or in your car you know? hold, or hold in up, your pants. You know? or, or in this case, in your pants. Yeah. Hold up the um, the old school one that you were holding up before without the spike, please. So now you were talking about this being a part of our genetics. It, it looks like a femur with a ball joint. I mean, it does. You know, this was probably... Uh, born of that, you know, I, it, this it is totally have. unscientific, unhistorical, yeah. but it looks you know, like a ball joint. Yeah. And what's interesting is um, the way these were traditionally made, um, you would uh, have to go through the forest and harvest a sapling that was usually growing on a creek uh, side. So creek sides, especially in the Northeast, very steep banks, like you had lots of rivers and stuff. You had to get around on canoes Um and the trees that grew on those banks, you had the root system, the root girl, and the trunk would grow offset because it's on an incline, right? And so what they would do is harvest those saplings, uh, air dry it, and then finish it. And so that's what defined the offset uh, for the, oh. the root girl. And the other way to do it is to find a branch off of a tree trunk and cut it. Like th this is how this one was made. This is from um, Eastern Hop Hornbeam. Uh, which is what we would call around here ironwood. It's an extremely hard wood. But this was made from a branch coming off of a trunk, right? So they were grown in together. And so one of the uh, challenges with the thumper was making sure that, like, the grain run out, you know, didn't run out severely in the ball section, right? You I, want I, I the don't... grain alignment, right? Okay. So you want the, the grain to run along the handle, which it does, for strength, just like any tomahawk or axe handle. But then when the grain transitions into this impact section, you want that to stay straight along with the ball. And there's just variability in wood. So there can be a little bit of grain run out here. And that's again, where that steel stud offsetting the load, transferring mm. it closer to the handle can help you. Um, so, you know, these, you know, I test them two handed, you know, powered up blows slamming into a piece of hardwood, you know, and they're holding up great. 
Uh, and you know, they were made for hitting people, right? Mm -hmm. Um, they are not going to hold up if you're slamming this against the material that has no give like a concrete block or a steel uh, bar you know that's not what they're made for but against material where this can bite in and transfer that impact momentum it's good uh, a kneecap for instance yes that would definitely <laughs> that would be <laughs> um, bad news <laughs> so on the empress and also on the back ripper you use this um cool kind of epoxy i don't know it's like a black gummy material uh, as mm -hmm. part of uh, to to accentuate the cross wedging you have um in the top uh is that what's holding the metal peg in the the slot there that yeah so it is tight fitted and then we have a, a black resin uh that we put in around the the uh, stud and deeply inset it and so it's about two and three eighths of steel inside uh with a tight fit to the wood plus that strong resin and so you know this isn't uh going to bury deeply into any material anyway right. you know it's a, projecting about a half inch but you've got way more uh engagement of the rod strongly bonded to the war club for extraction so uh the reason we use the resin actually with uh, the stingrays and the empresses isn't for adhesion at all it's to fill in that gap and prevent any gap between the bottom of the cheeks and the handle for moisture and stuff to get through. Like the wedges are what hold the head firm. These act as sort of a gap filler. Um, but for the war clubs, you know, it's not just a gap filler. It is uh, helping secure the stud. And traditionally, when they had like antler tines or pieces of iron, um, you know, pine pitch and other natural glues would be used. And really, if you guys uh, get interested in buying a traditional war club made in a traditional manner, um, the wood checks like crazy, especially on a root burl. Like there are all sorts of, of cracks and stuff in this. Oh, and makers fill this with resin and it holds up. Um, so people like kind of underestimate the strength of wood. Like they think, oh, if there's a crack running through the wood, that means it's going to break. And it's like, no, I, you know, wood is uh, an amazing material. You know, you can backfill wood with uh, adhesive and cure it clamped under pressure and it'll hold, be even stronger than it was before. Um, so anyway, well, you're, to you're talking that that's what this is about. So you're talking yeah. about um, we're, right now we're talking about a root burl and a and a spherical or, or, or approximating spherical. Uh, thing, but but we also um, have war clubs all over the place of, in the Philippines, in Fiji, in um, uh, South America that are more paddle shaped, where mm -hmm. you're getting hit with a very uh, slender um, portion kinda of like, that. Kind of yes. like the saber style war club, yeah. And, and uh, those are made from boards, uh, basically. Um, they would have to make a board off of a tree trunk, and um, you know, this one around 11 ounces is similar. Ours are averaging around 11 and a half ounces. It is very similar. Um, and so uh, these are actually a more prolific and popular style of war club than the ball headed sections. Like you don't really see the ball headed style war clubs uh, much beyond the Northeast woodlands. And then as some of those tribes got pushed out in intertribal warfare into the plains, they continued with that. But these saber style war clubs were everywhere, all over the United States, or what eventually became the United States. So the Southeast, the Northeast, on the plains, gunstock saber style was uh, the most prolific. Um, were, were they really uh, actually made from gunstocks? Or no. was it okay? That's, okay. that's just something that uh, collectors call it. And there's different theories on like the real angular ones, like, oh, they designed them to look like gunstocks. And I don't know about that. I mean, there's way before guns came to the new world, like when, you know, the early, you know, Spanish uh, interactions, like with the natives from the Spanish who were with, armed with crossbows and stuff, they had this style of war club, right? It looked basically, they described them like a wooden cutlass or a wooden falchion sword. Mm. Um, and so, you know, maybe different angular versions were made that kind of looked like a gun. And collectors these days call those gunstock style war clubs, but um, I'm not sure there's strong evidence to say that they designed them from gunstocks. 
Got you. Got you. I always, when I was a kid, when I first learned of those, uh, I made the assumption that they were salvaged gun stocks that were turned into like fancy clubs. Now on those, you'll frequently see uh, a sort of double edged uh, mm -hmm. dagger like blade. Yep. Th that seems to be a lot more about the, the, um, the cutting, the puncturing, oh, yeah. the slashing. Yeah, definitely. And that's what's just so amazing to me. It's just like in one continent, North America, the diversity of war club designs by itself is just amazing. Like I could spend the rest of my life once a year coming out with a different design iteration just off of that um, and never run out of designs. But you look across the world, and it's just there's so many. You're talking about those Polynesian war clubs. Some of those are incredible. They had like throwing war clubs, like the missile clubs. You know, um, I've seen those in uh, like museums and stuff and, uh, you know, just all kinds of different interpretations of how to make natural material in your environment useful to you to protect your family and your property, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Cold Steel did a a uh, version of that throwing missile. It was about a, you know, 14 <laughs> inch bullet shaped thing that you just. Oh, yeah, the, tor it, the torpedo. I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It might stick or it might just knock you out. You know, it's like it's just a big bar yeah. of metal. Um, the uh, uh, oh, what was I going to uh, mention? Oh, oh, you, you're talking about things from your environment that you would add to your war club. And we were talking about the uh, uh, Polynesian style with the tiger shark teeth all along the uh, all along the flat. Um, yeah, we have some guys, uh, RMJ, uh, RMJ tactical. You know, they make uh, tomahawks and stuff. They do, uh, um, I don't think it's a regular thing, but at Blade Show, I saw they had a couple big, beautifully um, made um, war clubs, the flat kind, I think Aztec or something. I'm not sure, but they have. Or, yeah, JB Knife and Tool did something like that, too. They did, too. Yeah. Oh, man, yeah. I, I love their their stuff, too. Yeah, not, not wearable, but uh, you wouldn't want to, like, uh, if you're a burglar and someone came, found you in the, your their house and they had that, that would be bad news. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those things are pretty intimidating. So you uh Wingard Wearables is also responsible for making um we you also have the dick pick, you have the uh the um quill, yep, and Grab. and other other implements of chaos or or utility, we should say, because yep. because they are both. Um, and then you just came out with the smaller dick pick that's yeah, the cool. micro dick pick. Yes, yeah. I'll I'll show that one, but yeah. And we're kind of next year. We are we plan to come out with the Dick Pick Magnum. Uh, okay, that, that is going to be like based on replicating the lethality of a full up sized medieval dagger. Yeah. Um, but you know, with the Dick Picks, you know, you got the hammer face, the pry bar. There are some times you need more momentum, more leverage in the pry, so going bigger. It's going to help you. So I'm excited about next year because the uh, Dick Pick Magnum will come out. Um, our Dick Picks right now are about six and five eighths. Micro Dick Picks are like four and five eighths inches. So we're targeting, you know, north of 11 inches on the Dick Pick Magnum. I need to, yeah, I need to get the, I want the smaller one. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I've slept on that, which is, uh, which is rare uh, <laughs> for me to sleep on a Wingard wearable because, uh, you know, I love them. Oh so yeah, much. yeah, yeah. Uh, but but the spear. Now this is something you don't we don't hear about as much. Are you still making the spear? And tell me a little bit about that. Okay, so the micro pike. Micro. That pike. was our. I should have brought one of those out here. Um, cool. We made twenty of those, so that was like basically a hand forged, curved, uh, leaf blade spear about two inches long on a uh, almost fifteen inches of steel that was curved to fit could conform to your waistline. And um, my wife would knit in a loom the leather that went over it. It took her two hours per uh, grip to knit these things. And, uh, you know, we eventually, it was not a fast seller because our brand really wasn't established then. And it's okay. also just a weird looking thing. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't look mm -hmm. like a war club or a tomahawk or a, uh, you know, our dick picks look like a, an ice pick or a scythe, that sort of thing. It has nothing out there like it. And so I do think um, we are going to bring that back. We've temporarily discontinued it. I want to rethink the micro pike, um, 
get some more utility capability in there and bring mm -hmm. it back with a, you know, our brand's grown since then. And I think that'll be more successful on launching. Uh, so, so MicroPipe Gen 2, that's what we'll, call it. Uh, yeah. we'll We'll be waiting for it because uh, I like, you know, one thing that I've always been drawn to about your work is how you take, um, well, I mentioned it up front, you modernize the concept of the carry of something like this, but it's not in all of these modern materials. It's still like, it's still assembled in these old world materials and old world ways. And, and I was there's something about that it reminds me a little bit of winkler knives i was talking to daniel winkler on this show and mm -hmm. and kind of marveling about how navy seals who have access to the most high-tech gear out there period gravitate towards these revolutionary era inspired knife designs in wood you know and Absolutely. leather i oh, love yeah. that yeah and i think definitely for them you know uh it's one of those things like talking with soldiers and soldiers and even special forces operators have purchased our products before and we will occasionally have interactions with them. But it's like when you are in a job like that, even though it's rare to get in a hand to hand combat tangle, that is something you do fear turning the corner and someone's there where they shouldn't be and you're wrapped up. And, you know, your, your guys are jammed in a doorway. They aren't able to access you to help you. Um, so that is like the worst case scenario. It's basically trying to control your weapon with one hand while defeating an opponent who could be stabbing you or gouging you or who knows what. Uh, and I do think that's why, you know, there's a, a need for that. It's sort of like a, being prepared for the worst case scenario increases your confidence going into any scenario um and so that's why i do think there is that sort of appeal and that's part of our rationale behind the dick pick magnum is um you know as great as tomahawks are for close quarters combat uh, when you're talking about near peer like think in a future let's say we're fighting an opponent that's wearing helmet and plate carrier mm -hmm. they're kind of invulnerable to uh a tomahawk, you know, maybe uh, cuts to the neck and that sort of thing, uh, even hits to the face, unless it's a concussion, isn't going to do anything uh, because the body armor is that good. Um, even though Kevlar can be pierced and things like that, you know, the vitals are covered with a ceramic plate, you know. Um, so we do see value in, in making like bigger versions of this tool, you know, that can actually be inspired by those medieval daggers that bypassed armor and can mm -hmm. reach the vitals uh, very deeply. And so we're really looking forward to that. We're, we're tiptoeing into, um, you know, products that soldiers could find useful. That was never what we were initially about. We were about civilian context, but, you know, you get more demand signals and you adapt to it, like the Molly uh, compatible versions of our Tomahawks. Um, but yeah, that's that's always like a big uh, honor to me when I hear from you know a soldier that's purchased something or where they give me feedback of their experiences they had before with other styles of knives um, that let them down. Um, mm -hmm. and it's like okay, you know, it's good to provide products that do something new capability wise. Not it's not about building something cool, although cool is always good. It's got to sell, right? Um, it's about addressing a gap in the market and providing some new capability. You've talked in the past uh, in in our conversations about the difference between uh, desanguination or exsanguination. What's the word? Mm -hmm. And yeah. and then and then uh, just sort of raw impact. You yeah. know the difference between cutting someone or or stabbing someone with a blade or hitting them with a tomahawk. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Oh, yeah. What? What? No. I was. I was going to say. What? How do you? What? What are the differentiations? And and how do these different weapons cover cover? All right. Fish? So you got a K bar knife. That's the classic, right? Um, you know, you can slash with it. You can thrust with it. Um, but given the width of the blade, this is a big blade to EDC. By the way, this would be mm -hmm. a very difficult, uncomfortable blade. I know that because I used to try to carry these things. Um, but with a knife, you know, you can achieve a biomechanical incapacitation if you cut and sever um, 
nerves and, and big muscle groups in someone's upper extremities or, or lower extremities. And that would be a less lethal way to incapacitate them, right? Or you can sever an artery or do damage and thrusting into the vital organs so that you know their blood pressure drops to the point that they lose consciousness. So exsanguination um, is very difficult for a knife like this to target the central nervous system. It can happen. Um, there was a disgusting incident out in Philly uh, somewhat recently where a guy kidnapped a teenager who was taking him home to commit a crime. And the teenager opened his Boy Scout knife and stuck it in the guy's spine and paralyzed him, right? So knives can occasionally do it, but they aren't designed for it, right? Mm -hmm. They aren't good at um, splitting through bone. And so that's where things like spikes, um, if they're long enough, can reach, you know, go through the face to the back of the brain. You need a really big spike to do that. That's what those medieval daggers were able to do. You know, when you bypass armor, you shoved a, a dagger through a knight's uh, isolates in his helmet. You know, you had a really long spike to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, the knives that are uh, common now, like uh, field knives, you know, big single belly knives, aren't terribly good at stabbing. Um, and certainly uh, have difficulty getting to the central nervous system. But if you have something like a tomahawk or a war club, um, because of the momentum, you have all that, that lever arm, that reach, that impact, maximum impact, um, even if it doesn't penetrate in very far, like this war club, uh, or even our stingray tomahawk, the chopping blade isn't projecting very far, it is going to bite in and transmit momentum it is going to damage the brain and, and knock somebody out um so or that's you could just they, turn it around and be oh yeah yeah be oh, sure yeah, of it. Yeah, do it, do it do it that way yeah so that's where if you can shut off the computer someone's out instantly and they may survive uh in fact there's lots of historic accounts where people got tomahawked like in the forehead region Oof. and they made it uh and that's because you know if you look at the the brain you know, the front two thirds of it um, are not the structures of the brain that are vital for your life to continue. You actually got to reach into the back. And so I look at tomahawks, like if I'm incapacitating someone with a tomahawk versus a knife, knives in many ways are more lethal because you have to stab somebody so many times to get the exsanguination to happen mm -hmm. that they have almost no chance for survival, yet they're, they're taking so long to pass out, right? Um, you know, it could be seven seconds or more uh, with the most lethal stab you could do into the heart. There's been horrible videos of stuff like that where it just takes so long for someone to uh, pass out when they're, you know, actively resisting. And so, uh, you know, in some ways I do see Tomox as being, I will, I'll say less lethal, but clearly if you hit someone in the head, yeah. I mean, that's, you only do that in the most dire circumstances. But that's why I see the difference. Um, I do think there's a place for biomechanical incapacitation. Like I, um, the combat consultant for uh, Spyderco, so it's Janet. You've interviewed mm -hmm. him, yeah. And he's he's a big fan of trying to get folders to be capable of that. Um, and it is a lot less murdery than you see with like libre fighting, where they're you know stabbing someone like a half dozen times in their neck and their eye and their chest and it's like yes that will incapacitate that person but boy that that is gonna be bad looking to law enforcement when they yes. Respond. Um, yes versus Funny. you know one blow and it's, it's over um you know so that's that's kind of what we, we hope to bring to the table but i do think biomechanical is something we're gonna visit um i mentioned i think last time i think you had asked us like, are, is Wingard Wearables going to come out with a knife? Yeah. The answer is, is, the answer is yes. Uh, and it's hopefully going to be this year. We're collaborating with um, Tate Buzzard at the Norman Tactical. Uh, oh, so yeah. On yeah. Instagram. So, uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, we're we're working with him. We got a unique design that I, my wife is like, don't show it. Because you know, we no, learned no, no, our no. lesson. You don't show prototypes till it's ready for production one. But it is going to be... Um, a big knife, so think K bar knife size only, feasible to be worn, right? Comfortably. 
So that's where we're going. And I, I do think biomechanical will be part of that. But that knife is uh, going to be interesting. We're, we're targeting sort of a kitchen camp knife type capability, like a big blade with purpose, mm -hmm. um, not just to make a big blade, but actually be able to like grab it in two hands, use it as a draw knife or a scraper, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, the future is really exciting. It's, it's, that's... It's, a, it's an abundance of designs in front of us. It's just infinite. And so that's we're, cool. That takes uh, time to pursue them. The, the, um, uh, first of all, I like the Norman tactical a lot. I've been following him, um, him on Instagram for quite a long time. And there's one, one knife in particular that I'm, that I'm always, uh, happy to see uh, on his feed. Can't remember what it's called. Is it like the dirt hummingbird or something? Oh yeah. The little pick all guy. Yeah. Yes, yes, yep. yes. I love that little knife. Uh, but, but also, um, just that there is a lot of uh, potential, especially when you look at um, blades of, and and I know you're not married to uh, the 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 Eastern Woodlands, you know, period and and all of that, but but there is there are a lot of great uh, historical knives to look back upon um, when when coming up with this. So, like you said, like you could just keep going with designs and. Oh, and yeah. take cues from different uh, great historical um, knives. You know, of course, I'm thinking of Bowie's. I love Bowie's, and that's a huge Bowie phase right now. I can't oh, stop yeah. talking about them. Uh, but all sorts of great, great influences you can bring in. Oh yeah, I, I just it, it's so it's kind of like you just never never have enough time. Like, yeah, that's the that's the one thing. It's just like you know we're we were actually hoping to get three or four designs launched this year, you know, like, uh, we want the knife out this year. Uh, we wanted, uh, we're working on our first all metal Tomahawk. Um, so Ooh. not full tang, but historically there were all metal Tomahawks, uh, basically hand forged like a fire poker, Okay, know? like okay. no That's handle scales on it. Like, it, and you know, we have a real exciting design for that. Um, but it's just like everything good takes so long. It's like, yeah. and especially when you, you have to outsource aspects of the design and this isn't to, to crap on anybody we work with, but there are always things that get lost in translation or different scheduling priorities. And it's like, that's just the nature of the beast when you're having to outsource, like our, our workshop is tiny. If we weren't outsourcing, none of these things would be reality. And we'd be charging a fortune for what few items we could uh, make. Uh, but yeah, all metal Tomahawk next year, hopefully. Um, Dick Pick Magnum and a big knife. That's so, awesome. So we're targeting 2023. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, um, uh, one one thing I want to touch on before before we dip out of here is uh, you mentioned materials, uh, or we were talking about materials, and you mentioned uh, the possibility of working in different materials. Uh, what did, what, what were you meaning? Uh, like you talking about for the war club? Yeah. Yeah. You were in general. Um, well, anything in general, cause I know you work with Volpe's a great, uh, uh, company that makes trainers for all of your stuff and they, they just do cool stuff in general. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, but this is what I'm wondering, uh, cause those are all high impact plastics Yes. And it seems like you could, you know, you might be able to design something within that realm. Yeah, that could be possible. And I mean, clearly we, we collaborate with Volpe's uh, to make our trainers. The show brought some trainers out. Um, he's actually making his own uh, war clubs, uh, not just training war clubs, but um, I would definitely recommend folks check them out. They don't have metal embedded in them like that yet. Um, but I mean, that's something to think about. Um, the only problem I've had with um, the high density polyethylene is like, uh, there's some about wood that, although wood is not as durable as uh, high, high density polyethylene, it does have uh, lower density. Uh, so you get better center of mass forward because mm -hmm. the handle weighs less. Mm -hmm. um, and there is better texture. Um, but, you know, one of the ways he addresses that is by um, doing various like uh, scallop sands and sanding in the surface or perforations. So that, like, for instance, on our Tomahawk handles, you got more grip on it. And the most recent war clubs I've seen him uh, 
using it. So like, it's like wrapped in jute, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, and so that'll definitely work. Um, so yeah, I got, I got to think about that because clearly that those things are like unbreakable. He's got videos of like his sword trainers where just people have done everything they can to break those things. Um, but it is sort of like a baseline material feels like ripping a bar of soap. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not, not, not wet soap, but like even a dry bar of soap, you're, you're yeah. holding on to it and it's like, Hmm, you yeah. know, but you can clearly address that, like be at a flare out where you did, did wraps. Um, that, that's definitely, uh, very feasible for texture. So I, I really am a huge fan of that. And if you guys, uh, you know, if your listeners are interested in war clubs, in general, he's got a lot more diverse designs. He's got like gun stock style war clubs and everything yeah. of various yeah. sizes. Uh, so it's really cool. I know he's a, uh, he seems to be a Filipino martial artist and, and has a lot of uh, cool influence uh, there with mm -hmm. his, with his work. And his is all hand, like he grips the pieces by hand. And it's just standing behind a, a bell grinder, you know? Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's, it's awesome. It is. I would consider that like hand ground, right? Because that's literally what he's doing. Yeah. So. Okay. So uh, back to Wingard wearables as we wrap. Uh, tell people the best way to a keep up with you, but b what is the availability of uh, of the Empress, the Back Ripper, the Stingray, the Dick Picks, the Quills? Uh, how can people find them, and what are their availabilities? Thumper, of course. Oh, um, I think almost everything's in stock. The best way to follow what we're doing is Instagram. Uh, we post just about every day, sometimes multiple times a day. Um, YouTube, also follow us there if you like long form videos. We do a lot of like YouTube shorts, but we're trying to get back into doing the long form videos. Like uh, I think one of our videos is uh, me and Ernest talking about war clubs in general. And that's like an hour long video. Oh, cool. um, so YouTube is, uh, is good too. Uh, but we're at wingardwearables.com. Uh, and there's links to uh, our site through YouTube or Instagram and everything is pretty much in stock. We've got, you know, probably a half dozen dick pics, uh, over a dozen micro dick pics. We've got, um, you know, uh, over a dozen thumpers left. And I'm going to be working on a new batch uh, after Thanksgiving. But definitely get a thumper for Thanksgiving. Black Friday is going to oh, yeah. be a nightmare. It's like you and that <laughs> person fighting over that last flat screen TV. Right, right. You know, or there's and, the last stick of butter at the grocery store. It's like, and you, you can't use this yeah. at the no, grocery yeah, store. That's, that's a little, yeah, that's overkill. Less, yeah, you can do the, not the ball side, but this side, you know, a little love tap. Just, just, just a suggestion. Well, but it's also apropos of the holiday itself when, when, uh, you know, European colonists like ourselves, or I'm not that I'm a colonist, but Europeans like ourselves uh, <laughs> yes, got together, yes, got yes, together yes. with our, with our uh, tribal, you know, brothers and there were war clubs present. So yeah. Yeah. There were some, some war clubs got pretty wet too, from what I understood. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, it's a, it, it is a seasonal. Uh, and you know, if you have a frustrating time with your Thanksgiving family, you can walk outside and, and hit, a you know, pumpkin or something to let your frustrations out. Well, I do want to say in all seriousness, it's exciting because, uh, you've expanded capacity, uh, over the last year and a half. And, and it's exciting to see that, that your, um, that your products are available all the time because that, that can be. You know, in it the beginning, it's, be. yeah. yeah, in the beginning, it's cool because it's exclusive and and yeah. it's exciting when you have a drop. But really, people want to know that they can show up and get something when they want it. And that's an Absolutely. exciting development. Yeah, we don't like uh, the artificial scarcity. Like, hey, we only made 10 of these. It's like, yeah. no, if it's a good design, make it as much as you can for exactly. everyone to have it. Thank you very much for, uh, you know, inviting me on. And, and again, Jim back there, just like... It's wonderful. My pleasure, Zach. So as always, uh, have a good one. And, and and I will let you know as soon as I get my uh, thumper. And definitely, and I'll, be, I'll be blabbing yeah. all about it. Yeah, you guys remember, be edgy and, and get a blunt impact weapon sometimes. Blunt is, is the way to go. All righty, sir. Take care. 
The GetUpside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. GetUpside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Before we started talking, I was telling Zach, uh, this is my bedside tomahawk, and I've uh, it's been that for quite some time. Uh, this is the Empress. It's a spontoon. It is so cool. We didn't talk about it much, uh, but like I mentioned before, go over to wingardwearables.com because uh, stuff is now available, and it's cool. You can just go there and get it. You don't have to wait for a drop. Uh, these are handmade in America, and... They're really, really cool and exciting. All right. So be sure to join us next week for another exciting interview. And uh, I want to bid you all a, a wonderful, wonderful week. Until next time, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.